Hi, this is Father Jeremiah of Grace Anglican Church here in Gastonia, North Carolina, and today we're going to talk about one of the canticles called the Te Deum Laudamus. Now, if you're new to this channel, I ask that you do me a big favor. Hit subscribe, hit the bell icon, and you'll be notified whenever we post new content here on the channel, whenever we put something up that's new. Also, hit the like button and hit the share button so you can share it on social media, whatever network you're a part of, and that lets other people discover us more easily. It helps our channel to grow and it helps others to discover Christianity, helps others to discover the Anglican way and how we worship here at Grace Anglican Church in Gastonia, North Carolina, and how Anglicans in general worship. A canticle is a hymn of praise, typically drawn from Scripture itself. Sometimes it's an entire passage of Scripture, and sometimes it's various phrases or various verses linked up together to create a hymn of praise that the church uses to respond to God's Word. These particular canticles, you find the Te Deum Laudamus and the Benedictus on page 17 and 19. Those are the traditional ones that are typically used with morning prayer, but there's other ones listed. There are supplemental canticles that can be found on page 79 and 88, and I'll make a video about those other canticles and using them, but here I want to focus in on the Te Deum Laudamus. The Te Deum Laudamus is a very ancient hymn that the church has used. It probably came about and was written sometime in the late 4th century. The Latin name Te Deum Laudamus can literally be translated as, You, O God, we praise. And the English title for it is simply, We Praise You, O God. That's the words that are found in the very first half of the verse, of the first line. We praise you, O God. And so we call it that. We praise you, O God. The Te Deum Laudamus. You, O God, we praise. And it draws heavily from Scripture. It draws from a general understanding of what Scripture is teaching us about God and what He has done on our behalf, what He has done in creation, what He is doing throughout the world. No one knows who wrote it. All we know is that it began to be widely used in the late 4th century AD. After all of the councils that were dealing with understanding God as a trinity, understanding Jesus' divinity, understanding the Holy Spirit's divinity, that they are co-equal with the Father, that God is not a singular person, but he is three distinct persons sharing one essence, that there is one God, yet three persons. And those three persons are each in themselves equally God, and therefore worthy of worship worthy of admiration, worthy of honor and glory that is ascribed to the one God because they are all God. Each person is God. And that controversy was huge. It lasted from before the Council of Nicaea in 325 through the Council of Constantinople in 381 AD. Even though the Council of Nicaea determined that Jesus is God and gave us language to speak about that, how he is one with God and yet distinct from God, the church continued that controversy. There was controversy back and forth for another seven, over 50 years of controversy until 381 when it was finally settled in a more sure way. The church finally came back to fully conclude that Jesus is truly God and the Holy Spirit is truly God. And when you read the Te Deum Laudamus, you hear that sense, that deep Trinitarian understanding, that desire to worship God as Trinity. Let me just read the first section of the Te Deum. And it says, We praise you, O God, we acclaim you as Lord. All creation worships you, the Father everlasting. To you all angels, the powers of heaven, the cherubim and seraphim, sing in endless praise. Holy, 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 Lord God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. The glorious company of apostles praise you. The noble fellowship of prophets praise you. The white-robed army of martyrs praise you. Throughout the world, the Holy Church acclaims you, Father of majesty unbounded your true and only Son, worthy of all praise, and the Holy Spirit, advocate and guide. As you see, this hymn is deeply enmeshed in the understanding of the Trinity, that our one God is three distinct persons, Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and that they are equal in majesty and glory and deserving of worship. Each person deserves worship because each person is God, and yet we worship one God. And alongside that, it goes on in the second section to speak of Christ being the King of glory, the eternal Son of the Father, that He will bring salvation, that He chose to come down to earth and to be born of the Virgin, to overcome death, to be seated at God's right hand, and that He will be our judge. And so we cry out, Come and help your people, bought with the price of your own blood, and bring us with your saints to glory everlasting, that our desire in seeing the work of God in creation, in seeing the work of God in Jesus Christ for our redemption, that we desire to be brought into that glory everlasting that is Jesus's through his death and resurrection. But another wonderful, beautiful part of this 
Him. Is listen to that. The glorious company of apostles praise you. The noble fellowship of prophets praise you. The white-robed army of martyrs praise you. Throughout the world, the Holy Church acclaims you. It teaches us that we are not alone in our worship. We never worship alone. Even if I'm sitting in this office, or I'm sitting in a room, or you're sitting at home all by your lonesome, you are not alone. As you enter into the worship and the praises of God, as you come into prayer and scripture reading, the entirety of the church, triumphant and militant, the church here on earth is worshiping God alongside you. The church in heaven is always worshiping God. And so we enter into their worship. We don't just come to a moment of spontaneous worship. We are entering into worship that is already ongoing as we come and worship. My worship that might be by myself is never alone. And that's a huge and important thing for us to understand that I am never alone when I worship God. I am always amongst a host of others, of angels and martyrs, of angels and prophets, of angels and apostles, of angels and the militant church here on earth. But we are all worshiping the Lord together. In our various times and places, we are together in our worship. And that's a beautiful teaching that we need reminding of in our day and age, that my worship is alongside everyone. I personally worship, but I don't worship personally alone. I always worship in the presence of the entire church. And it's a beautiful thing to remember that, that I am never alone when I worship God. I am united to the entirety of the church because the entirety of the church is united to Christ himself. And all of that, the last thing I want to say is this is one of my favorite canticles found in the Book of Common Prayer. The first time I read it nearly 20 years ago, it just blew me away to read something that was so focused on the Trinity. In fact, it was so focused on the Trinity, it made me think of the simplicity of the Apostles' Creed and explicating God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit in teaching us about the Trinity in teaching us about the work of God in creation, the work of God in salvation, and the work of God in bringing us to himself. And that's how you can hear this. Hear it as telling us about what God has done in us responding in praise. And this is what we respond with after we hear from the Old Testament. We respond with praising God for who he is in himself as the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And to draw this into your daily life, is to reshape your worldview, reshape yourself into focusing on God as Trinity, refocusing yourself not on your own struggles or your own problems, but on the great and glorious work of Jesus, of the Father, of the Holy Spirit on your behalf, and to bring everything about life into perspective because all of life is driving us toward worship of the Father, worship of the Son, and worship of the Holy Spirit. The Te Deum Laudamus reminds us of that. And in the concluding section, it says, Save your people, Lord, and bless your inheritance. Govern and uphold them now and always. Day by day we bless you. We praise your name forever. Keep us today, Lord, from all sin. Have mercy on us, Lord, have mercy. Lord, show us your love and mercy, for we have put our trust in you. In you, Lord, is our hope. Let us never be put to shame. It ends with a prayer asking the Lord to save us, to redeem us, to lift us up out of the miry clay, out of the struggles that we had and have and to uphold us always, to draw us away from sin and to have mercy on us when we do sin, to know God's love, and a final confession that the Lord is our hope. And one last petition, let us never be put to shame. We trust in the Lord, we believe in his holy name, and we want him to work in us, that we might be to the, his praise and to his glory in all that we do. And so we read lessons from scripture, we read an Old Testament and a New Testament, and then after that Old Testament, we respond with the Te Deum Laudamus. We respond with Praise to God, a hymn that has been in existence for over 1,600 years. It has been used by the church almost daily since its inception in order to praise God, to sing to him a song that reminds us of who God is and what he has done. And so I hope that you find this helpful, that it blesses you, that it helps you to draw near to our God more deeply as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and to know that as Anglicans we are wanting to reshape our hearts and our minds and our wills to better know God, to better love God. And so we have hymns like the Te Deum Laudamus. We focus on reading scripture, large chunks of scripture, in order to inundate our minds and our hearts with the Holy Spirit. And we always want to respond with praise, not to some generic God up in heaven, but to the Trinity, to God as he is in himself, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And so I close with this blessing for us all. May the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with us and among us always and forever. Amen.